Amen. Before we get started, just a, just a word of uh, look at verse 2. Uh, David is saying, from the end of the earth I call to you, and when my heart is faint, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Think about that rock this morning, and just, it, it's the central focal point of this psalm, the rock. Uh, and we think about it, uh, that it's, the rock is a place of refuge, it describes it a place of help, a place of wisdom, and it's higher than I. God is stronger, wiser, and greater than our, even our greatest expectations, and more secure than anything I can find, and nothing else is helping return to the rock. Of course, Jesus Christ is that rock, and as we seek after him, I want you to think about it in your mind, as we're told here to seek after him, what I want to place in your mind is the scene in the New Testament when the Lord Jesus Christ is going about, and there's a multitude of people around him. And there was a woman who came up to him, and she must have been crawling on the ground, because she said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, and by the way, she had an issue of blood, and so according to the law, she was not to be in public. So she was going against the law so that she could just get to Jesus, and she said in her heart of hearts, if I could just touch even the hem of his garment, I'd be healed. And so she touched him, and Jesus looked around and said, who touched me? Peter, you know, Peter's always the one that sticks his foot in his mouth by speaking first, and Peter says, I mean, Lord, who touched you? Look, there's a multitude of people around you. <laughs> if people were touching you, he says, no, I, saw, I felt, as it says in the King James, I felt virtue go out of me. And the woman stepped up. I think she had to stand up because I think she was really bowed down before. She said, I touched you, Lord. And she rehearsed to him how she had had this issue of blood, and she went to all the physicians, and they took her money, but they couldn't help her. And she said, I, I, I said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I would be healed. And Jesus told her to depart in peace because her faith had made her whole. Now, that is what we're getting at in Psalm 61. That kind of faith that is demonstrated, I need Jesus so bad, I'm not going to stop at anything until I... Touch the hem of his garment. Now, before we get started and unpack this beautiful psalm, look at the title. The title is to the choir master with stringed instruments of David. In other words, he's saying, this, I want this to be taught, and I want it to be sung to rehearse this. Now, we're going to re sing a song at the end of the service called Rock of Ages. It was written by a guy named Augustus Toplady. Wouldn't you like to know a guy named Augustus Toplady, right? He was a very famous preacher at the time, by the way. And a lot of our hymns are written by men who were ministers of the gospel. And what they were looking for was a way to end the service. They preached for two and a half hours. And we need to have a conclusion now. <laughs> some of them did, some of the Puritans. But anyway, they wanted to look for something that would recap and just send the message home. And that's what he did. So this is kind of like... When we sing at the end, hopefully Rock of Ages will drive home what we're talking about here, but David wants this driven home constantly to be sung among God's people. So this truth is Psalm 61. Now, I'm calling this God's medicine for any ailment, and I'm breaking it down several ways. Number one, uh, I, the, in verses 1 and 2, I see this as reaching for the medicine. This is applying faith and reaching out for the medicine. Medicine is no good unless you reach out for it, right? If God, or if, you're God, if your doctor prescribes medicine and it sits in your medicine cabinet, it doesn't do you any good. You need to reach for it, okay, and to apply it. Secondly, the benefits of the medicine. Now, hopefully if your doctor prescribes medicine, he'll tell you this is exactly what it's going to do for you. So David describes the benefits of this medicine in verses 3 and 4. Now, we've heard a lot about case study of medicine lately. You know, people are talking about the vaccine for COVID, and they said, you know, we, uh, we, need, to have, um, we need to have the case studies. In other words, people were, you know, don't tell me that I'm going to have to be vaccinated. I want to know that it's worked on a number of people before I start taking any kind of vaccination or any other kind of medicine. And so people talk about case studies all the time. Well, verses 5 through 7, as David says, here's the case study for this medicine. Here's what it did for me. I took it, and it's good. 
And then the last thing we'll consider, the administration of the medicine or the protocol in verse 8. All right, let me read Psalm 61. We sang it before, but nevertheless, let's hear it in its context here. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth, I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. For you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Prolong the life of the king. May his years endure to all generations. May he be enthroned forever before God. Appoint steadfast love and faithfulness to watch over him. So will I ever sing praises to your name as I perform my vows day after day. All right. The first thing we're looking at is reaching for the medicine, and there's four things about that. He talks about crying, and we look at the pleading there, or the calling and the seeking. First of all, the crying. He says, hear my cry, uh, and this cry, of course, to God could be with or without words. Have you ever cried to God without words? <laughs> I believe we have, and it's called groans. <laughs> there's a lot of us groan, right? Well, the groaning is a calling for God for relief. Okay, and even as, isn't it good to know that the Holy Spirit is helping to lift that burden off of us? It says he groans with a, a groaning or an utterance that cannot, or a, a groaning that even cannot even be uttered. In other words, it's indistinguishable. Well, notice some scriptures that I put under that, that David says in Psalm 40 that he inclined to me and heard my cry. A cry. I think right away, I go right away over to Exodus chapter 3. Remember when Moses met with God at the burning bush, and God says, surely I have heard the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. I've, or excuse me, surely I've seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, and I know their sorrows. Just that, that scripture just kind of makes me kind of have goosebumps, you know, it's just to think. God says, I've... I've seen the affliction, and I've heard their cry. And then he says, I know their sorrows. There are times you can't even describe what you're feeling. There are some of you who have physical pain, and it's constant, and you like, nobody knows. He does. Sometimes all you can get out of maybe is a, is a cry. Or you have a situation at home, you don't know how to even describe it to God. It's just a cry. Maybe it's even in a groan. You can't even put it in words. David says, I cried to the Lord, and he heard. <laughs> also in Psalm 102, he says, He regards the prayer of the destitute and does not despise their prayer. I love that because the destitute person doesn't even know how to describe it. I, I'm destitute. What do I do? He says, their prayer is always heard. So when you feel like you don't have any answers, you're in destitute condition, like the woman that came to Jesus. She was destitute. She came to Jesus. And Jesus relieved her burden. Crying then, it's a crying for relief. It's a pleading then. And the next words are, he said, listen to my prayer. Listen to my prayer. In Psalm 17, he says, give ear to my prayer. In Psalm 66, but truly God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Do you feel like God listens to your prayers when you're pleading? Of course he does. Now, we find the scripture that gives us an encouragement about that in 1 John chapter 5. I put on your outline. This is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us, and we know if he hears us and whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Well, then some people say, well, I don't know whether it is it God's will or not. You don't have to worry about that. That is something that you don't have to worry about. You just pray. Here's what happens when you pray. The scripture that I'm going to read here in a moment from Romans chapter 8 says, when you pray, the Holy Spirit interprets what you pray by the will of God. So what he's doing is you might ask for something really stupid, 
And he's saying, here's what Bob really meant. Okay? And what he also does is work on Bob so that Bob learns the will of God and Bob desires the will of God. And sometimes that takes a, a long sanctifying process so that I really desire that. For years I had this lung problem. And when I prayed for that God would heal me, he never did. I was praying the wrong thing. Okay? And God took me through the depths of a lung problem and almost dying through the process when I realized what he was doing. I was saying, Bob, you breathe because my strength is made perfect in weakness. So every day I get up and I know that every breath is a gift from God. <laughs> when I'm swimming with old John, we were swimming down there at the beach. And <laughs> okay? I realized every breath is a gift from God. I need more gifts, God. <laughs> no, here's what it says. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we don't even know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. You pray what is on your heart. But understand, it's not that your prayers have gone deaf, God's gone deaf to your prayer. He's going to answer, but he's going to answer according to what the Spirit has interpreted because the Spirit interprets according to the will of God. But he's also working on you so that you desire it. You soon learn the will of God in this matter, and you desire that above all things. God is so gracious because then we learn the will of God as we're praying. For instance, Jesus said, how many of you, when a son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or how many of you, when a son asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? I had this one time I was sitting in the presence of this old preacher who described that. He goes, I want you to just think about this. You're walking down the road and you see something that you think is your bread. And says, Daddy, I want that bread. Daddy says, no. Oh, come on, Daddy, I want that bread. Daddy says, no. Well, then you get closer and you realize, that wasn't no bread, it was a stone. <laughs> Sometimes it's just like you're walking along and you see that fish, Lord, or Daddy, give me that fish. No, son. No. You get closer and feel like, realize that fish is a serpent. And very harmful for you. Like an idiot one time when I was in radio and television in Cincinnati, I asked God to allow me to work in New York City. That was a dumb request. Because God says, no, I, you're, in the ministry, you're going to ministry, boy. Okay? But it was a dumb request. We, do all, we all do that. And some of that dumb request is, take this away from me right now. An apostle said that, too. So you're not alone when you feel that way. Paul said, I prayed three times that this thorn in the flesh, whatever it was, we go through all the things that might be, but you consider this. Three times he said, Lord, take it away. How do you think he asked that? I believe he was making a good case before the Lord. When Paul's never short on words, right? Okay, so he was asking three times, Lord, take this from me. What was the answer? Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, and my strength is made perfect in weakness. So how did Paul spell relief? When I'm weak, then am I strong. Next point. Calling. Notice he says these words. From the ends of the earth, I call to you. There's a sense of being distant from God. You ever felt distant from God? Sometimes the anxiety or the problem that you need relief from causes you to feel like you're at a distance from God. In Psalm 116, he says, He inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call upon him. Psalm 118, Out of distress I called on the Lord, and he answered me and set me free. Now, in Jeremiah 33, Jeremiah is describing the fact that his people are going to be taken into captivity and, and what God would do after they were taken into captivity. So in Psalm, or excuse me, Jeremiah 33, he says, 
It gives the people a promise from God to take with them when they go into captivity, when they're going to feel far away from God, because they're going to be far away from God's house and from fellowship with his people. And so he says this, here's a promise to take with you. You all know it, because uh, it's my favorite promise. <laughs> and it's what J.R. used to call God's telephone number, Jeremiah 33.3. God says, you call, I'll answer, and I'll show you great and hidden things that you know not. It's to a people that were about to be taken into captivity into the land of Babylon. Far away. We called him and we feel distant. What could be more distant? I've got to chase this rabbit for a second. What could be more distant from God than before God has converted us or changed our hearts? We're at a distance. We're in darkness. We are dead in trespasses and in sins. And yet, he says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's calling from a distance. There is no greater distance than you call from the name, on the name of the Lord, and he hears. Notice it says in Romans 10, verses 8 through 12, what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart, that word of faith that we proclaim. When the preaching of the gospel goes forth in that word of faith to tell you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the one who de- died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. There is something in the heart of hearts of a person that has been changed, as it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. He says, our gospel came not to you in word only, but in power. Not in word only. It wasn't just words that you heard. There was power. There was something changing your heart. It says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, it says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to, to the Greek. The power, it's the dynamite. It comes in and explodes the hard heart. It changes us. And we said, Paul says right there, he says, that word of faith which we preach, it's in your mouth, it's in your heart, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The scripture says everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew or Greek, the same Lord of all, bestowing on his riches all who call on him. Now, in case you missed it, he says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But then it says in verse 14, how will they call on him of whom they have not believed? How will they believe on him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Who preached to you the good news, first of all? You know, uh, there's a, some, there was this old tradition that was pretty cool that a person was converted under the, of a, by the, a preacher under the, as the preacher was, he wasn't converted by the preacher, he was converted by God, changed by God, but there was this old tradition that you'd uh, have the preacher sign your, your Bible. Okay? That was an old tradition. It's kind of cool. But stop and think about it. Whoever was preaching when you came to Christ, let's backtrack. They weren't preaching because they decided they want that as a career. They were preaching because they were called of God. You know, Camilo sat before a candidate's committee this week, and they wanted to hear his call to the ministry. Both Nick and Heath sat before that committee before. They wanted, what's your call to the ministry? You know, I remember what um, Martin Lloyd-Jones says. If you can do anything else, do it. But if you're called to the ministry, then you can't do anything else. That's why they want to know. You have an outward call, you know, that, where you have demonstrated that. And somebody says, I think you've got a call to the ministry. But there's an inward call that says, I can't do anything else. And he says, how are they going to preach except they're called? They can't preach unless they're called. Unless they're sent by God to do this. And so you stop and think about it. Just stop and think about all the things that God orchestrated when you first heard the gospel, okay, and God put it in your heart to call upon him to be saved. God orchestrated all the things that happened to that preacher to bring that preacher to that moment. God orchestrated all the things that that preacher had been studying to come to that moment to preach that very text of scripture that he preached. Whoa! All because you were a marked out vessel to say, I want this sheep to hear my voice and respond to me in the preaching of the gospel. Is that cool or what? That is so cool. That is God doing it. 
The preacher doesn't get any glory. He's the one who was sent, prepared, and used by God as just a vessel to speak the word of God. And the spirit of God worked in your heart, brought the two together, and there's gospel dynamite that goes off. Well, that's good stuff. Anyway, let's go on. All right, there's crying, there's pleading, calling, and there's seeking. He says, when my heart is faint, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. I love Psalm 42 that we sang. Listen to those words. It says, dear pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food by night and day, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? I appreciate very much how Rick has been teaching on this depression subject and how a lie comes into our hearts and our minds all the time. God doesn't care about you. Where's God now? David would answer that in Psalm 18. Listen to the words. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. God is, who is God but the Lord and who is our rock except our God? In Psalm 46, 40, 18 verse 46 he says, the Lord lives, blessed be my rock and exalted be the God of my salvation. Why is this medicine called the rock? This this is, a, this is such a rock, this is a great rock, that no one even gets to the rock except they are led to the rock. You have to be led to the rock. Who leads us to the rock? The Spirit of God. It leads us back to the rock. First Peter says, So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone... The rock that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, a stone of stumbling and a rocket of offense. They stumbled because they disobeyed the word and they were destined to it. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The medicine is so great. It's called the rock. So many great qualities and benefits that... Uh, I'm going to get to it in a moment, but first let me just let me chase a rabbit here. There was a, one time I, I was preaching in a church, and there were these two old ladies that used to hang out with Jan and me all the time, and it, they, was, they would sometimes go with me to different preaching appointments that I would have where I'd preach at other churches, and they always say, Pastor Bob, you know all the pig paths in life. Now, I can see that didn't register, so I will explainify it. That meant I knew all the shortcuts, okay? And going down this, okay, you got that. All right, so sometimes I take pig paths, sometimes chase a rat. It's all the same thing. That didn't go over well either, so mark that down, Bob. Do not do that again. In James chapter 5, there's an addressing of people that are sick. At the end of chapter 5, Heath is going to be getting to that one of these days. He's going to brush on it a little bit the next time he preaches on the first Sunday of September, but he'll preach on it after that. By then, I hope to have my book out on it, so I'll accuse him of plagiarism. No. <laughs> All right. This is something that I really believe in. In James chapter 5, it says, If any among you sick, let him pray. Number one. Secondly, you are to confess to one another. I, I realize he says sins, but another translation says faults. And I could think you could put in sicknesses where, there as well. You talk to others in the church. It's written to the church. We're to tell one another that we're sick and ask for prayer for one another. And third, it says that when you're sick, you call for the elders of the church that they might anoint you with oil. And it says the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. Whose faith? It's not the elders. The elders simply... Did, what to do, as I was told one time, you know, when somebody asked for that, what do you do? Just open the book and do what it says. And it's not the elders going around saying, anybody be healed today, we've got the oil. No, it's not the oil, it's not the elders, it's the faith. And whose faith is it? The one who is sick. And how do they demonstrate that faith? By calling on the elders. By calling to the church. By praying. Those three areas are needed in our church. 
in our society, in our people. It actually is given to the church. I'm not stirring up a nest, but what I'm saying is we carry heavy burdens because we don't follow the scriptures. And so when we come to this, this medicine, you reach for it. There is a, a cry. There is a call. There is a seeking. There is a pleading with it. When God lays out in his word, here's how you do it, you do it that way. Sounds simple enough, doesn't it? We believe it for every other aspect of life. Why not this? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, by the way, says, He that comes to God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of those who seek him. Because he says, without faith, you cannot please God. How do we demonstrate that faith? Taking God at his word and doing what he says. Applying the scriptures. Because he says, seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. All right, I need to jump on the second point and notice the benefits of this medicine. Four things there, a refuge, a strong tower, a tent, and a safe shelter. Let's break it down. First of all, he says, you've been my refuge. Uh, be a rock of refuge for me, he says in Psalm 31, a strong fortress to save me. Psalm 62, you're my mighty rock, my refuge. In Psalm 94, he says, but the Lord has become a stronghold, my God, the rock and my refuge. Note again that David pleads to this rock of refuge. It's rock of refuge. He found refuge as we looked at other psalms that David was running and he found a cave and it was a place of refuge. And so this, this medicine, when you're seeking after God and applying this medicine that he gives of, of any kind of ailment that we have, we find that it's almost like we've gone into a place and shut the door And you feel safe. Wow. It's a refuge. Secondly, he says a strong tower. A strong tower against the enemy uses. A tower. We don't have walled cities today, but a tower as part of the walled city was used for two things. Number one, if a person would go up in the tower, they could see where the enemy was, right? You'd see how they're getting close they're getting. Send down word. They're coming from the east, okay? And the more towers, the better, because there's more people to see. Plus, it's a place of defense. Can you imagine they're getting, they're getting close, <laughs> pelting them with rocks from the tower, right? I always thought that would be pretty cool to be up there. Anyway, so, he's a tower. He's a strong tower. Psalm 48 says, walk about Zion. That's the, the city of God. In the New Testament be the church. Walk around the church. Count the towers. Oh, towers. Place of strength. That's Jesus, right? He's the one that sees what's coming. He knows what's coming. As a matter of fact, the multiple towers are the multiple views we have of the Lord Jesus Christ. Same person. Okay, he's our savior. He's our redeemer. He's our friend. He's our husband. He's our guide. <laughs> he's our king. Multiple, multiple towers. So what does he say in Proverbs 18, verse 10? The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run into it and are safe. Ah, the tower, the tower. It's exalted above all. The name of the Lord is above all things. Psalm 121, I think the feeling that David gives, it says, I will look unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord who made both heaven and earth. Don't you love those mountains? Jan and I are watching the, <coughs> let's see, Criterium du Dauphiné. It's a bicycle race in France, in eastern France, in the Alps. And Jan has, she began watching bicycle races with me because she likes the scenery. She's caught the fever, though. She kind of likes the racing, and she knows the people, too. How come Chris Froome's not doing too well, she would say? Or how come this one, you know? And so... Uh, but it's gorgeous. They were climbing a mountain yesterday. <laughs> it's just, they showed the scene of this valley that's surrounded by mountains. And I thought of this psalm. I will look into the hills from whence cometh my help. 
My help comes from the Lord who made both heaven and earth. He's a strong tower. Note again, that it's a, he also uses the word tent or tabernacle. Let me dwell in your tent or tabernacle forever, meaning the house of the Lord or the tabernacle. That's the signifying of God's presence. That's why he says in Psalm 23, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Or in Psalm 27, one thing I ask of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He wants to be with God. So he says, this medicine brings you into God's presence. The presence of the Lord. Have you read the book of Ezekiel lately? Probably not. We get bogged down in many views there. Um, so let me just take you to the last chapter and the last verse. Here's what it's all about. <laughs> okay, and it corresponds with the latter part of the book of Revelation. And he, Ezekiel was given this vision of this mighty city, and it's the city that is described in Revelation, chapter 21, 22. Okay, in that he says, and he says, the name of this place, the name of that place, from this day forth shall be. The Lord is there. The Lord is there. And so are we. <laughs> is that good news? Oh, it sure is. So David says, when I apply this medicine, I, I'm in his presence. And it's a fullness of joy. <laughs> Moving on, he also uses the word like a safe shelter. He says, let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. In Psalm 17, he kind of used the same thing. Hide me under the shadow of your wings. In Psalm 36, he says, the children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. In Psalm 63, he says, you've been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. Okay, let's picture. Let's see. We have big birds around here. Ducks, goose. Okay, uh, I was thinking, I've ever, never really seen this in a pelican. Maybe I shouldn't use pelican then. Okay, so let's just think about a bird. Say you saw a duck or a goose and has little, little babies, ducklings with the mother, and she wants to hide them from a predator. She will gather them close to her and cover them with her wings. They can't be seen by the predator. And they're close to her heart. So David says, one of the benefits of this medicine is you are drawn close to the heart of God. And you feel safe and secure. Isn't that good? Wow. Relief. Let me jump ahead because David gives us a case study here. And what he tells you, that God hears, he provides, he preserves, and God oversees. So first of all, God hears. He says, you, O oh God, have heard my vows. The vows, of course, are prayers of commitment. Sometimes they're a commitment, and this is a prayer. He says, you, in Psalm 65, O oh, you who hear prayer, in Psalm 139, he tells us that God hears. We must understand that God hears everything. He knows our words before we speak them and our ears and our thoughts before we think them. And we understand, as it says in Matthew chapter 6, that God knows what we have need of even before we ask, and yet he tells us to ask. So God hears us. He knows what we need. He delights to hear from us, though. He delights to hear us. And David says, he called on the name of the Lord. He says, I, in my distress, I called the name of the Lord, and he answered me. David's study also shows when you seek this medicine, you'll find that relief because you're knowing that God hears, and secondly, God provides. He says, you've given me a, uh, the heritage of those who fear your name. The heritage. Um, Psalm 16 says that the lines have fallen, in me, uh, fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a beautiful inheritance. Which, have you ever thought about your inheritance? Now, my parents certainly were rich and I didn't really get a big inheritance. Of course, my mother's still living, but I didn't get an inheritance from them. Don't, didn't count on it. I'm not talking about this earthly inheritance. What's our heavenly inheritance like? We talked a little bit about this in the Bible study this morning, but listen to these words. 
from uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 15. You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we call Abba Father. That's part of your inheritance, by the way. The Spirit of God nudges you from within and call to God as your Father in heaven. That's a, that's a mark that you're a marked out child. Okay, secondly, he goes, the Spirit himself bears witness of our spirit that we are the children of God. The Spirit of God is called the down payment of our inheritance. So the working of the Spirit in you, even when he gives you that nudge in sanctification, said that's wrong and calls you to repentance, it's still part of your inheritance. That's a first fruits of that inheritance is your down payment. But then he says this, if we are children, if, if children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Whoa! Do you understand what that says? That says whatever belongs to Christ in the future is yours. What'd you do to earn it? Not nothing. Grace. And so when you look at the eternal perspective compared to the things you're suffering now, here's what he says. He says, and verse 17, or excuse me, verse 18. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. <laughs> Did you get that? You could be burned at the stake right now. And you could suffer. Gr I, I hate that thought, but I've, I've read of many Puritans. The way they were burned at the stake, you know what they were, were looking at? Not at burning at the stake. My inheritance. I'm almost there. <laughs> this suffering is going to pass in a moment. And all that's left for me is inheritance. And the presence of God. That's all that I have. So he says, when you suffer, keep in mind your inheritance. That's what David says. He's, he's provided this glorious inheritance. Now, he also said, he talks about preserver, preserving here. God preserves, prolong the life of the king that his years may endure to all generations. Now, obviously these next two verses, these, these two phrase, next two things, point to the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of David, okay? But what I want to get to is, is, is just the fact that God preserves and God oversees, Preserves, as it says in Isaiah 53, the Lord Jesus Christ, he shall prolong his days and the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. The Lord Jesus Christ's kingdom goes on forever, as it says in Daniel chapter 2, that it will stand forever. Jesus himself must reign until he put all enemies under his foot, feet and the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And so he comes down to this, how God preserves us in Romans chapter 8 because of our glorious King of kings and Lord of lords that he has preserved even through death and coming out of the grave, he says this, I'm sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor or rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. David would say, God hears, God provides, and God preserves. Fourth, God oversees that he may be enthroned forever before God and appoint steadfast love, faithfulness to watch over him. There's a text of scripture that is quite often misquoted by people, and it's only a segment of it because they miss the last part. Listen to it. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Have you ever heard that? Sometimes it's used to scare, scare you. But whatever you're doing, God sees. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro over all the earth. Actually, he sees everything before it happened. Okay, the last part of that is this. To give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. Well, that's a good news, isn't it? God's looking to see whose heart is right. It's made right by the Spirit of God. It's made right because they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's out there to bless them. How does he bless them? Right there it says, steadfast love and faithfulness. Steadfast love and faithfulness. Sounds like Psalm 85, 
We're talking about steadfast love and faithfulness, meet and righteousness and peace, kiss each other. The work of the Lord Jesus Christ when he's on the cross, steadfast love, God's steadfast love was shining down on us. And the only way that he could love us is that there would be a propitiation for our sins and faithfulness sprung out of the earth. The Lord Jesus Christ was faithful to his calling, lived a perfect sinless life. Righteousness and peace have, as it says, kissed each other. Right there. That is the mark of all of our blessings. Okay, one last thing then. How do we take this medicine? How do we apply it? What's the protocol for this? Three things. Number one, sing praises. This is an expression of gratitude. He says, so I will ever sing praises to your name. Psalm 7, verse 17 says, I will give uh, to the Lord thanks to, due to his righteousness. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. In Deuteronomy, he gives a little warning to this people and says this, God's going to judge you because you did not serve the Lord with your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart. Wow, what if that was carried out today? How would you stand before God? Ooh. Did you ever complain this past week? Ooh. Okay. Did you ever get angry? Ooh. He says, steadfast, okay, God says, what I'm looking for is joyfulness and gladness of heart. Well, if you want to avoid that, what do you do? Gratitude and praise. Psalm 92 says, it's good to give thanks to the Lord. Psalm 147 says, it is pleasant to give thanks to the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, uh, verse, actually verse 18, he says, it's the will of God. So it's good, pleasant, and it's the will of God. And it's wrong if you don't. <laughs> so, daily giving thanks to God, gratitude, and there's a multitude of reasons why to be gr grateful. But it's good for you. It's medicine that is applied. It's God's medicine applied to your ailment. Secondly, apply yourself to perform vows. Live up to your commitments. He says, as I perform my vows. What's the greatest commandment of all? To love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. There was a time when God made himself known to you and you prayed that Jesus Christ would save your soul. You called upon the name of the Lord. And there's probably a, a, a response of a vow connected with that. You said, Lord, I'll live my life for you. I offer myself to you. When you come and join the church, you take a vow of commitment to the church. When you stand before the minister in a wedding ceremony, you take a vow to be committed to your spouse. And so he says, I will perform my vows. And one of the ways that we do this is repeat those vows again to live up to them. One of the things I like to do when I perform a wedding ceremony is remind the people that hear the vows of the young couple, that, or sometimes they're old couple, but when the couple that are taking the vows is to be reminded of the vows that they took, to a covenant renewal. We're about to have a covenant renewal here with the Lord's Supper. My surgeon makes me have a covenant renewal every time he sees me. Before he replaced both my knees, he made me promise I wouldn't run. And so every time he sees me, he says, Bob, you haven't been running, have you? And he sees me quite often because he rides bikes with me, too. Bob, you haven't been running, have you? Oh, it's a covenant renewal, David. No, I haven't been. And I haven't. I said, I was tempted. We saw the Ironman World Championship on television. Jan said, now that you have two new knees, you want to try it again? Go for number 20? I said, no, nah, I made a promise. And that's what he's getting at. You renew the covenant you made with God. And lastly, how often do we apply this? Day after day. I perform my vows day after day. Day after day. We understand in Psalm 42, they, the adversaries come at us from every angle, day after day after day after day, moment by moment. Satan is a roaring lion prowling around. So we need something to counter that. Counter that with gratitude and praise to God and renewal of your vows. 
Psalm 68 says, God daily bears us up. Or the King James says, He daily loads us up with benefits. Psalm 86, he says, Be gracious to me, O God, for to you I cry all the day long. Daniel, of course, prayed three times. Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says, You pray this way, give us what? This day our daily bread. I mean, it's implying that you pray daily. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, listen to this one. Paul says, I die daily. I offer myself to be sacrificed daily. And in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13, it says, We are to exhort one another Every day. All right. That's the medicine. Praise. Renewal of your vows and commitment to the Lord. And do it daily. Seeking after it by crying and pleading and calling. Enjoying the benefits. A refuge, a tower, a tent, and a safe shelter. Knowing as David says, that God hears, he provides and preserves. And he oversees. And this benefit Medicine is to be taken on a daily basis. I conclude with this. The results are relief. Relief can be expressed this way. It's a freedom from the bondage of seeing yourself tied to that ailment. What's one of the problems of having pain? You're tied to that pain. What's one of the problems of having relief? You're tied to it. Everything whatever ailment it is. So listen to what the prophet Zechariah was given for his people that were stuck in an ailment, whatever it is. He says, as for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. <laughs> stuck in the mire. That's what God's medicine does. It may not heal your body, but he's in control and you don't need it. Because you have him as your refuge and strength and strong tower and help. And the power of his presence is so great. It's better than life. And that's what we are to seek after. Notice in Zechariah, it says it's all based on the blood of the covenant. 